Hello, my name is Linda Brissett, and I'm a nurse practitioner and director of the Comprehensive Stroke Center and CV Service Line at Mass General Brigham Women's Hospital. I'm here today to talk about the care of the acute ischemic stroke patient treated with endovascular therapy. I have no relevant disclosures. My talk is drawn directly from the AHA scientific statement, Care of the Patient with Acute Ischemic Stroke Endovascular Intensive Care Unit Post-Interventional Therapy. Today we will discuss nursing responsibilities in pre-procedural, periprocedural, and post-procedural care in the patient undergoing endovascular therapy. We will briefly review possible complications and intensive care unit considerations for the post-interventional patient. To provide some background, intravenous thrombolysis remains a standard treatment for acute ischemic stroke, but after a series of positive results from randomized clinical trials published in early 2015, canical thrombectomy has become an additional standard of care for those with large vessel occlusion. Large vessel occlusion occurs in approximately 30% of patients with acute ischemic stroke. The addition of mechanical thrombectomy for stroke required an update to the AHA ASA 2009 Comprehensive Nursing Guidelines. Nurses play a pivotal role in the care of patients with stroke through coordination of care across the continuum alongside the radiology technologists and the proceduralists. Although nursing roles may vary within the endovascular suite, Interventional nurses are often responsible for the pre-procedural, periprocedural, and post-procedural nursing care in this population. Patients with stroke with disabling symptoms attributable to LVO are at high risk for neurological deterioration, airway compromise, and hemodynamic complications. Interventional nurses need to anticipate the needs of the patients, recognize potential complications, and maintain patient safety. Practice guidelines support the performance of a pre-procedural assessment and review. Before the start of the procedure, the nurse should verify documentation by the provider of the patient's history and physical exam, a melampati score, an ASA physical status classification score to assess airway and predict the anesthetic and surgical risk. Patients with decreased mental status, posterior stroke, high NIH scores or major cardiopulmonary disease are more likely to require extra support and intubation. Recognition of patients who may require more aggressive airway management is critical before the procedure. Vital signs, lab results, and NPO status should also be reviewed. Pre-procedure, the nurse should, depending on a role, also check the monitoring and emergency equipment in the room. This includes cardiac monitors, oxygen masks, defibrillator, and code carts. The nurse should also understand the sedation and blood pressure plan. Best practice also demonstrates that the NIH score should be documented before the procedure and could be completed as part of the handoff communication with the transferring department. Although no single evidence-based standard exists for frequency of vital signs in neurological assessments, pre-procedure it is reasonable to assess at least every 30 to 60 minutes and more often if thrombolytics have been administered. Baseline assessments are critical to recognize whether the patient deteriorates and also to anticipate when additional neuro exams might need to be completed. Before the procedure, it is reasonable for nurses to perform and document a neuroassessment and limited baseline assessment, which could include an assessment of the patient's level of arousal, cranial nerves, motor and sensory response, and coordination. In anticipation of any endovascular intervention, a baseline neurovascular assessment of the patient's extremity should also be obtained. This includes distal pulses, capillary refill, skin color, and temperature. Immediately before the procedure, the team performs a universal timeout per the organization's policy. Once the patient arrives in the procedure room, current practice guidelines support the assessment of vital signs, EKG rhythms, pulse ox, and tidal CO2, pain level, anxiety level, and level of consciousness. 
Vital signs are monitored every five minutes during the procedure. Who monitors the vital signs will often depend on whether or not an anesthesiologist is present. Neurochecks during the procedure should be performed when indicated. For example, if there is a sudden change in the patient's status or presentation. This would be done in collaboration with the treatment team. During the procedure, the nurse monitors for adverse side effects, level of sedation changes in neurological status, and procedural complications. The interventional nurse is aware of possible neurological emergencies, including increased ICP, EVD drainage issues, hypo or hypertension. Careful blood pressure management is key to maintaining sufficient cerebral perfusion pressure to the collaterals to an ischemic penumbra, while also mitigating the risks of complications from excessive hypertension. The post-procedural monitoring phase begins at the completion of the thrombectomy procedure and sheath removal once hemostasis is achieved. Sheath removal time and time of hemostasis should be documented. Current evidence supports the completion of a repeat neuroassessment after the procedure and an NIH score. The nurse should monitor for access site complications, including arterial spasm, pain, swelling, bruising, bleeding, hematoma, pulsatile mass, and drainage from the puncture site. The authors of the scientific statement provide some guidance regarding the timing of post-thrombectomy vital signs, neurochecks, and site assessments. If the patient received IV thrombolytics in addition to mechanical thrombectomy, it is reasonable for vital signs and neurological monitoring to follow the same manufacturer's guidelines for IV thrombolytic therapy which we know is vital signs and neurochecks every 15 minutes for two hours, every 30 minutes for six hours, and every one hour for 16 hours. Because standardization often leads to decreased errors, the AHA scientific statement suggests that even if thrombolytics were not given, it is still reasonable for the nurse to restart monitoring of vital signs and neurological status in a similar manner. So vital signs and neuro checks every 15 minutes for two hours, every 30 minutes for six hours, and every hour thereafter, according to current ICU standards of care. Of course, the nurse also wants to monitor the access site, distal pulse circulation. And the best practice timing for that is every 15 minutes for one hour, every 30 minutes for one hour, and every hour for four hours. The endovascular nurse should be aware of possible complications of endovascular therapy. During the procedure, the risks include vessel perforation or dissection, embolization to a new vessel, medication side effects or allergic reactions, hemorrhage, and increased intracranial pressure. Post-procedure, you may see things like access site occlusions, injury to vessels and nerves in the soft tissues of the access site, and failure of closure devices leading to bleeding, as well as asymptomatic and symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. We'll now talk briefly about ICU care. So handoff to the ICU nurse should include the patients presenting symptoms, the area of infarct, intervention, post-intervention NIH score, and the neuro exam, time of hemostasis of the access point, and any complications or concerns. It should also include a family contact if possible and any particular issues to the patient, family or social issues. Nursing care after thrombectomy focuses on airway, breathing, circulation, and supportive care. Nurses' recognition of changes in patient status and early interdisciplinary involvement may minimize acute ischemic stroke complications and improve patient outcomes. The ICU nurse should continue post-procedural vital signs and neurological assessments. They should complete an airway assessment to assess the ability of the patient to maintain and protect their airway. The patient should remain NPO until after swallow evaluation. Cardiac monitoring is a standard for the first 24 hours after stroke to observe for dysrhythmias. This time may be extended for patients who have suspected atrial fibrillation. 
the nurse should minimize the risk of increased intracranial pressure. They should avoid straining when coughing and suctioning or during bowel movements, reduce excessive environmental stimuli, and cluster nursing activities when possible. In the ICU, VTE prophylaxis should be given unfractionated heparin, a low molecular weight heparin in combination with intermittent pneumatic compression in patients without hemorrhage. Early enteral nutrition is key to recovery. There should be a dysphagia screen and diet consult early on and an enteral feeding decision within the first 72 hours. As always, it's important to keep in mind the patient's and family's goals of care. Early communication is key and also palliative care should be called in when appropriate. The authors of the scientific statement included highly useful tables that can assist both in nursing training and possibly be used as cues on nursing units. So I recommend looking at the um, scientific statement in full. In summary, nursing care of the stroke patient after endovascular intervention continues to evolve. Ongoing research is needed to include the appropriate timeframes for assessment and interventions, but this AHA statement by Rogers and her colleagues provides a much needed update for best practices in post-interventional nursing care. Thank you for your attention.